Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Good, good. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to hear a little bit about storage and components for building open compute solutions with hard drives and SSDs. My name is Walter Hinton. I'm with the company you probably don't know, but likely use our products. Uh, HDST has been in the business uh, for over 50 years. We were part of IBM's Global Storage Technologies Group, then we're sold to Hitachi Data Systems, and now we are part of Western Digital. Uh, we are the leader in enterprise storage worldwide. More than half the world's data rests on some form of HDST technology, either solid state or hard drives. Today we're going to talk about putting pieces together. We're actually going to build some stuff, have a, have a good time with that, and uh, do a little do a little digging into what's going on in the industry as well. So as, as part of Western Digital, HDST is focused on enterprise. We have a full lineup of SSDs uh, from extremely fast uh, NVMe compliant PCIe. Uh, we also are the leader in the marketplace for SAS SSDs. So most of the uh, hybrid arrays or all flash arrays that you see if you crack them open and pull out a drive, it will be an HDST uh, SAS SSD. Uh, we also are makers of the most hard drives for enterprise in the world, uh, ranging from 15K high-speed drives to uh, the highest capacity helium-based technologies today at 10 terabytes. And we're just introducing some new systems as well. There's a, a JBOD, a 60 drive JBOD that's available. Um, super great density, uh, very good packaging, and select from your favorite flavor of HDST drive to go into that. And then at the high end, we also have a multi petabyte active archive system based on object storage. So a, a full spectrum, if you will, of technologies uh, for open compute. So, the theme is what's hot, what's cool, let's, let's build. So I'm going to talk about the hot side for a minute. Um, despite what you might have heard, uh, there is no crossover point that we see in the near future between SSD and HDD, especially when you look at capacity HDDs. Uh, we, we maintain quite a significant gap in uh, price per gigabyte when comparing uh, HDD to SSD. At the same time, you can see that SSDs, of course, are coming down at a, at a rapid rate. And we say that they've moved into the mainstream. Uh, more and more enterprises are buying and buying into uh, the flash concept. This one I find really fascinating. This is SSD by location. Uh, this is a term IDC uses. And basically what they're showing here is that, yes, there's growth in SSDs for all flash array. But it's the server side where the real growth is for things like PCIe or NVMe. And I, I see that a lot in talking with customers. More and more folks are moving to uh, distributed architectures for databases. So, you know, MySQL, the NoSQL variants. And uh, those are ideal use cases for server side SSD, super low latency, very high performance. Um, this is a view of interface type. What you see here is that SATA is starting to, uh, while it's the, by far the highest shipments in volumes, SATA is starting to get squeezed a little bit, and there's a PCIe enterprise, uh, entry level that is coming soon that will encroach even further on the, uh, the, the SATA interface. And then, you know, yes, the faster it is, the more expensive it'll be. It's kind of like a car. But um, these are just industry averages. And you can see you know, that, that SATA is good enough for a lot of folks. And in that particular case, um, you, you won't pay as much. But I want to think about maybe a heat index in a little different way. And I want to normalize out price per gigabyte. So if you do that, and you say, what's the average IOPS in a normalized scenario? Um, you can see that NVMe or PCIe is, is dramatically better in terms of delivering performance for I.O., for uh, mixed workloads, and for sequential workloads. So, you know, if you normalize out the price, 
you got a little different decision criteria to make. And this is the basis of a paper you'll be able to find at HDST's website in about 30 days. And, and it ties back to um, work that was done in like the 80s with IBM. It was called the, the Economic Impact of Rapid Response Time. And basically what this does is I look at PCIe, I look at SAS, I look at SATA, and I look at all flash arrays, and I look at latency over time and compare latency against worker productivity. So if you've got 1,000 workers earning $100,000 a year and they're idle for some amount of time based on latency, their worker impact is significant. And, and that's what this is building out. And you can see that the closer you have the storage, in this case NVMe, to the server, the less I.O. wait time there is. There's no network latency, et cetera. Therefore, higher worker productivity. So let's build some stuff with SSDs. You can do shared storage inside servers with SSDs. Um, in the case of something like VMware vSAN or some of the alternative technologies, uh, basically you create little building blocks and, and grow those as you need. Uh, vSAN is a really cost-effective way to work in website type environments. Um, it's maybe not the best performer, so there are other things like Pernix or Maxta that can deliver maybe better performance than vSAN, but either way, if you're looking at a converged system, building it yourself can be very effective compared to uh, some of the prepackaged converged systems. You can also do shared storage for things like Oracle. Uh, there are software products that allow for Flash to be pooled and presented to something like Oracle ASM as a single volume of storage. And then ASM takes over, does its striping, does its replication, and you can grow an Oracle environment very, very nicely with all Flash. On the server side, uh, you'll hear people like Wikibon refer to it as server SAN. And uh, in one case, one of the largest telecoms in the world has seen that this approach is 70% less expensive than going all flash. And then for all the, the modern databases and the scale out architectures, uh, server side flash is great. The database itself understands that it's dealing with uh, storage management. So every node is, uh, is completely replaceable and it basically shards the data across all of the nodes, so there doesn't have to be a sophisticated set of storage management features down at the, the SSD level. So now let's talk about what's cool. Um, we've been making hard drives for a long time, and one of our talented engineers in the manufacturing line uh, figured out that if he injected helium into a hard drive, it would pass our tests much more effectively than air-based drives. So this filtered up through management chains, everything else, and about four years ago, we introduced the world's first helium-filled HDD. Uh, we've now shipped over five million of these things. Uh, they are incredible. We can improve density, we can improve reliability, and most importantly, because there's almost no friction in helium, we reduce the power consumption required for hard drive. So when you're scaling out a massive Hadoop environment, scaling out a massive CEP environment, your number one concern should be OPEX. And as you look at OPEX, what's the biggest driver of the cost of OPEX? All those darn hard drives. So we're doing our best to, uh, to make a difference in that area. And here's just an example. This is, a, this is a CEP scale out. And you can see here with the 10 terabyte helium, um, we're talking about 63% better operational cost than with our first generation six terabyte helium drives. So density, capacity, low friction, uh, low cost for total cost of ownership. So what's hot, what's cool, what's cold? The cold is chasing the long tail. And anybody in big data looking at analytics, here's the problem we run into. With Hadoop, one terabyte a day 
with Hadoop striping and everything else that it does equals a petabyte in a year. So your data nodes sprawl completely out of control. So by taking a different approach and being able to use high capacity drives, maybe you can keep more data longer, which will allow you to do better analytics. If you're ingesting a terabyte a day and you get to a petabyte in a year, you're probably gonna throw some stuff away that you don't want to throw away. But with this approach, maybe you can keep it. So one of the things that is relatively new in the big data world is the concept of tiering, right? So in June, Apache Hadoop came out with uh, 2.7, which introduced the idea that you could have tiers of storage. And the bottom tier doesn't necessarily need three stripes of replication to go sit for seven years. Um, something like an object store could be ideal. And an object store tends to uh, be very efficient. It's easily accessed, right? It's disk-based, so you can pull stuff back for analysis as you need back into your Hadoop cluster. Um, but with erasure coding and object storage, you get a very cost-effective medium for long-term archival of data. So just a little look at uh, that whole Hadoop environment again. Remember, if we're ingesting a terabyte a day, we get to a petabyte in a year, that's something like 280 servers if you're running four terabyte hard drives. That's a lot. Um, if you were to take a different architecture and use storage tiering, you could put flash on data nodes and high capacity hard drives on data nodes and have an archive over here, and you could have a very efficient system. Load times are faster, map reduce cycles are radically improved, things like shuffle and join that are uh, small block related are not friendly to a hard drive based data node, but are very friendly with SSD. So concept here is choose the right tools for the job. You don't have to have this classic symmetrical architecture uh, that, was, that was part of the original design. Uh, the industry's grown up and we've gotten better at giving you better tools. And we say, go build. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, okay, so are you asking about HDD or SSD or both? Okay, so the question is can multiple servers access a device? And the answer is it depends on what type of work you're doing. So if, you, if you're doing a shared storage architecture, then yes, the servers would be able to address you know, one, one device that's sitting on a server, multiple servers could address that device. If you're doing a shared nothing, where you're, you know, uh, NoSQL sharded database, uh, no, the storage devices don't know about each other at all. I, um, okay, so I think I understand your question. With, with a NoSQL, can I have that data accessed from another cluster of machines? Is that where you're going? Okay. To copy, right, yeah. Okay, so if I have a NoSQL cluster and I've got a set of data on it and I've got another cluster over here and I want to access, um, you, you do that either through your operating system or through the application. So if I've got a, a, a Cassandra over here and a Cassandra over here, I can set them up so that I could access that data without having to make a copy. Ah, 
Yes. Okay. So is there value for that type of model where uh, I'm remotely accessing a cluster of data? Uh, absolutely. Right. You're not, you're not spinning up a whole nother copy, right? So you're saving on space. Um, you, you, you have to watch what the workload is in the primary cluster, right? If it's heavy workload, having other machines access in may not be such a good idea. Uh, but uh, definitely it's a, it's a cheaper alternative. Okay, thank you very much.